Let me read just a real, it's a small passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It's a section of the epistle to the Corinthians that was about the light of the gospel, that that they had this ministry in Jesus Christ and uh, we were to be the light that he was coming to the world. Chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Can I use this? So, some of you who may be new to the abolitionist thing wonder why we make such a big deal about the differences between pro-life and abolition. Why are they going on? Is it just a rhetorical difference? You know? Are they just saying this because they want to be cool? Uh, Come up with something new, sell t-shirts, all these things. Right? We hear these things all the time. The reason is, is because abolitionists are sick and tired of pro-lifers practicing cunning and underhanding, underhanded ways. Instead of openly stating the truth, abortion is murder. Abortion is sin. And letting that foundation direct you where you go, pro-lifers have said, we're not going to call it murder. We're not going to call it murder because that's not going to be practically pragmatic and winsome and persuasive. So we're going to put that to the side. We're going to call it killing, maybe unjust. We're going to recommend that people do different things, so on and so forth. And then they, we wonder why it is that when they put forward a law, it doesn't call for justice. It doesn't call it murder. And it actually doesn't limit it or reduce it or restrict it in any way. Because all the pro-life law did, whenever it finally made it through the House and the Senate and signed by the governor, was regulate where, when, how to kill a baby. Before you kill a baby, you got to look at an ultrasound. If you kill a baby, you got to be 20 miles away from a hospital where babies are born. If you kill a baby, you got to kill the baby before they feel pain. In the first 140 days of their life, most babies are butchered in the first eight weeks image bearers of the living God. So when abolitionists look at the pro-lifers and they say, what you do is not having any kind of effect after four and a half decades of a Holocaust. And we try to bring up this point, the pro-lifers look at us like we're crazy. You know why? Because they're thinking, that's not cunning. That'll never work. Be wise. The world is not gonna follow you there. Be worldly wise. You guys are being fools. You're foolish. Do you believe abortion's murder? The pro-lifer says, well, yeah, I do, but I'm not gonna get up and say that. I'm not gonna put that in my bill, you know, because it's not wise. We wanna be fools, right? Worldly wisdom, ex nay on that. So along comes a group of people saying abortion is murder. This is a theological claim. Abolitionists, we make theological claims. We have a foundational basis. I'm not trying to mix, you know, I'm not trying to be a theocrat and say that we've got to like, you know, do something weird like that. But we know that abortion is murder. So if you start with abortion is murder, it's sin. What's the answer to sin? Somebody tell me the answer to sin. Educated group. So if you start out without abortion being sin, do you know what you don't have whenever you offer an answer? An answer. Well, sorry, that's a wrong way to put that question. You don't have an answer. You go in a dead end. Now, if you say abortion is murder and the answer is the gospel, you go out preaching the gospel, which is foolishness, is where the passage goes on. So you're a fool, you're out there preaching the gospel, and you're plainly stating it before the watching world. Why? Because you're obedient to the gospel. The pro life movement is disobedient to the gospel. So the differences between abolitionists, we want to take the opportunity to make sure everyone in the room knows. We're theological. The pro-life movement is secular. We are people of providence. If you're going to be theological, you've got to trust in God because everybody tells you it's not going to work. It's not practical. So you say, 
Well, I trust in God. We're providence people. We're providence, not pragmatists. Someone says, well, it's not going to work. Look at them dead straight on and say, you're telling me that what you've been doing for the past four and a half decades has worked? Oh. We wonder why the church is dead. It's because the pro-life politician says, come, vote for me, give to me, watch my thing. It's dead because it doesn't have the truth of the word of God. And that's why all the legislation and everything flows. Now, so if abortion is murder, how, how, how can we legislate it? Is it okay to legislate morality? Just checking. I mean, come on. <laughs> Just checking. So if we're going to legislate morality, if abortion is murder, how many ways are there to legislate it? One. Totally, utterly, immediately criminalized as murder. But it's harsh, right? It's very harsh. Why is it so harsh to say thou shalt not murder in our culture? Because we've been indoctrinated by the pro-life movement for four and a half decades to believe that's too harsh. These are people who say all men are created equal and that babies are made in the image of God. Yet whenever you choose to butcher a baby in the womb or let them die in an incarcerated, uh, in a cryogenic freeze chamber or something like that, when you choose to do that, the pro-lifer comes along and says, well, you shouldn't be punished, just the abortionist. Whatever happened to all men are created equal, equal justice. Why does this seem difficult? Even to some of you sitting in the room, well, it seems difficult. Is that really what Dan Fisher's running on? Well, if Dan Fisher's gonna be consistent and run on the truth, and we really are serious about equal protection under the law, it's abortion is murder, and those who choose to murder their children will be punished. This is the harsh reality of what we're dealing with here. And it's political suicide. Our world is so messed up. Most, all of the men that Dan is running, that, that, that Dan's running against, would, they're like, they're like, yeah! Dan's got yahoos on his stage calling abortion murder and demanding that it be abolished and criminalized and that the people who murder their children be treated like the people who murder someone at a gas station. Well, he's the only one that's consistent with anything. It's insane. And the reason that you might feel a little bit of tinge is because you have been indoctrinated. You've grown up in pro-life churches. You've been watching pro-life. I'm not authorized. I'm not speaking on behalf of the campaign. Have any of you guys seen Todd Lamb's commercial on Facebook? Or you just scroll by it real quick. Guy just like, oh, I'm pro-life. How pro-life are you? I'm very pro-life. What are you going to do about abortion? Be pro-life. It's a moral opinion, lacking moral action. Because if you can't start out with abortion is murder, you can't do anything about it. So we got a guy that's wanting to do something about it. And I've got a blank piece of paper right here. And we're faced with this situation. The church of the living God is now looking at a candidate. I'm going to say something a little bit. Half of you are going to be like, well, yeah. And then the other half of you are going to be like, huh. Any, any of you guys heard of the Church Repent Project? Wow, I've never heard. <laughs> this is the only auditorium in the world, I guess, where that was going to get collapsed. But the idea is that after about four and a half decades of this abortion holocaust, there's this group of people who are loony enough and serious enough that they're willing to disturb the status quo and try to expose the evil of abortion to some of the 100 million born-again, Bible-believing, professing Christians in this country. And they are actually considered crazy. They are actually considered heretical for this, anti-church. This is just the church of the living God rising up, trying to wake up the rest of the church and say, listen, you've not failed to be pro-life, you failed to be Christian. Every baby murdered in the womb 
is made in the image of God. Every baby murdered in the womb is your neighbor. I've given you two commandments, Christ says, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Every minute of every day, sacrilegiously, God is being defiled. As Rusty said, why is murder wrong? Because man's made in the image of God. Why is the church of the living God rising up to abolish abortion? Because we love our neighbors as ourselves, and we've been called to establish justice on their behalf. What is keeping us, and what has been keeping us, from doing this for the past four and a half decades. I submit to you the pro-life movement. Because it's right to think, I want to save the babies. It's right. I want to do something. Well, if the person who comes across and says, well, here's something to do. Put some money in this baby bottle and we'll, okay, that's good. Here's something to do, support this candidate, support this law, support this thing. All that energy, all that zeal, all that money, all those resources, all the different gifts from all the different people in the body of Christ have been being funneled into this pro-life industry. And they've been perpetuating the practice of child sacrifice in this country by regulating when, where, how, and who is allowed to kill these children. I honestly didn't think that I would ever actually live to see the day that a politician ran on a platform of abolition. I thought it was gonna be. You know, I'm a historian and it took about 20 years to get a guy who would kinda run as an abolitionist and we had to force him to do it um, in the midst of a war because as his side started to win, he said, man, we better abolish abortion after this thing or those agitators are gonna start another war. So it's very, very surprising that Dan is doing what he's doing. And I can only say that it's because God is living, he's active, he's an agent in the world, and he's building up people. Some of you guys, how many of you are, are, would consider yourself basically apolitical? Like you've turned your back on politics, like before now. Like, forget this, I'm done with this. And then you're on Facebook and Dan Fisher, well, Dan Fisher's like, and I'm on a horse. And you're like, okay, I'll pay, pay attention to this guy. You got a guy who's saying abortion is murder and you're like, well, that's what, it's, that's what I'd say on the streets and I'm out in front of a high school or a abortion clinic. That's, that's what I say. This guy's running for governor? Is he out of his mind? He's not out of his mind. Everybody else is out of their minds. So before I get off this stage, I wanna make a bit of a, of a prediction, if you will. When the abolitionist, the Church Repent Project, sorry, I go, my talks go like, and then they get back to where I was at. When the abolitionists are told, you're not doing it right, and they say, we want you to stand up for justice and mercy and love the preborn fatherless as yourself and practice the golden rule on behalf of your preborn neighbor. When the abolitionist says that to somebody who's dead in, in their abortion apathy sin, they may be saved, I'm not saying, but they're dead in that sin. They're 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 stone cold, ice cold, frozen, maybe chosen, but frozen. When the abolitionist says, what are you doing? They say, you're not doing it right. You're not doing it right. Tell me who to vote for. For five years, abolitionists have been going to churches, schools, clinics, conferences, making, making war online, saying, you need, to, you need to do this, 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 this. We need to think this way, think this way. You know what they always say? Well, tell me who to vote for. Because our culture has conditioned us to think that the only thing we really can do is vote. When really if 1% of the church of the living God went out to the abortion clinic tomorrow, like you wouldn't even be able to get a mile close to it. But you know, there's other things we could do. So that's a rebuke to all, the, uh, all of y'all who don't do that. But I'm just, you know, it's just my role, rebuked kindly. We, there's all sorts that we can do. But people say, I cannot you know, get behind this, 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 but if you tell me a bill to support, I get behind that. We put forward bills, 
The guy who speaks after me is going to tell you a little bit about that. Where's the pro-life movement? You know? They say, well, tell, give me a candidate to support that actually, I mean, I remember some of the pro-life leaders in this nation actually told me, they said, well, listen, if there was actually a candidate running on that platform, I'd support it. And then whenever I email them, when Dan Fisher starts to run, crickets, I don't know, maybe they lost my email or something. We are giving the church, the professing body of believers in Oklahoma, a very easy thing to do. The easiest thing, to wake up and go check a box. And if they do not do that, what left is there but rebuke, admonition? I'm going to pick up back on this line here at the end of the, the program tonight because we can't rebuke them if we don't get the message out to them. But right now, let's just thank the living God and praise him that all this agitation you loons have been doing at the clinics and the schools and on Facebook pages has actually begun to bear fruit, much fruit. We've got an abolitionist candidate running as an abolitionist calling for the complete, total, immediate abolition of abortion.